I'm going to show one other example, and I'm going to skip the rest to get done. This is a painting that's in the Metropolitan Museum. There are actually two ways to refocus. Here, we had the problem that it was fuzzy in the back. The octagonal pattern got fuzzy in the back, so the way we solved that problem was we refocused further into the scene, which reduced the magnification. That was the Lorenzo Lotto painting. There's another way to solve this problem. Just drag the scene closer to you. And this is what Robert Campan did. In this case, the magnification remains unchanged. This is in the uh, cloisters. So take a train uptown, and you'll go to it. I'm going to show you only, I'm not going to show you this evidence for lack of time. I'm going to show you the evidence in the back of the chair. It's complex lattice work. I'll make a lattice work. I'll correct it for perspective and see how well it fits. Well, it doesn't fit at all. I mean, no matter where I try to fit it, it doesn't fit at all. But we remember about optics now. Instead of trying to fit everything all together, we've got depth of field considerations. I'll try to fit just the front. So it's getting bad. Let me refocus my lens. It gets bad. I refocus my lens again. Everything fits to an accuracy of about an eighth of an inch. No way would a handmade wooden chair made in France um, be made to an accuracy any better than that. So if it had fit perfectly, we'd have other reasons we might suspect it doesn't fit perfectly. And uh, there's lots of kinks and stuff that we're just going to skip over for lack of time, where we get quantitative agreement. And the thing is, you can see the effects I'm showing you with your own eye. If you walk up to that painting and you look at it at a grazing angle, you can see where that blue line, it kinks into the green line, it kinks into the red line. Infrared reflect, uh, reflectogram gives us preferential sensitivity to the underdrawing. There's the underdrawing. Here's a qualitative piece of work. Let me magnify it more. One more time, I'll magnify it. There's his headband. Look how Campan made that line. Very sure line. Doesn't look like that at all. There's a line. Looks like this. There's a nice sure line. So from actually Hockney's book, this, we discovered all of this much later. Um, Warhol projected. If you project an, uh, a, an object, and you've got the difference between light and shadow, it's just really easy just to trace along it. If you are doing this by eyeballing, you do this. So it's qualitative um, uh, evidence that goes along with everything else. And we, the size and the magnification of the, the lens that we calculate for Campan is comparable to what we have for Lotto. And again, if we just look at this little bit, the evidence that we extract from this painting here in New York is a whole variety of things. And so now I'm going to skip ahead after this runs through. So all of this evidence that's in here, download from my web page. I'll tell you how to get to the web page uh, at the end. Ask me the question again, I'll tell you how to get to the web page. A good way to remember it. So I'm going to have to skip because of lack of time. Sorry about that. I'm going to skip ahead to near the end. Which is, there's all sorts of wonderful things here that you're missing. So another question, I'll answer the question you should ask. If optics was first started to be used around 1425, when did the artist stop using optics? I'm going to show you a visual history of optics-based paintings. All of these paintings and many more that I'm not going to show you in this, this movie um, are based, have elements within them that are based on optical projections. But I'm going to cover the 600-year period in 18 seconds. So if you blink, you're going to miss 100 years of art history. So don't blink. Here we go. Every one of these paintings is based, has elements that are based on optics. And they're the iconic paintings of European art from the last 600 years. So the answer to the question of when did they stop using optics, they never stopped using optics. They used it continuously from the time they were first used for the features where optics were helpful. So to summarize overwhelming scientific evidence that optics were used in a number of paintings, they're not photographs. This does not in any way diminish the artist's skill. If you thought Van Eyck was a genius, you seriously underestimated the man. That These are hard things to use, but the optics was helpful where it was used. And it does fundamentally affect our understanding of the evolution of the art of the past 600 years. It's not that this sudden transformation to realism was not noticed. 
it was noticed and it was puzzling. Now we can tell you why it was done. Here's what's so revolutionary about what you're saying. You're saying the history of art, the history of the Renaissance, is the history of optics. I am saying I that. I know that, yeah. and you're, you're blowing everything up. You're blowing everything that all of us who took art appreciation studied, all the art historians have written, and you're saying, you're all wrong. It's all about optics. So, so if you say things like this, you do get pickets. Um, and so... So thank you.